Hey, it's Nick with B&H, and I'm here with Andrew and Jabari, and we have joined forces to tackle the Blackmagic design booth because they have so many new products out that one person alone was not enough to cover it all. So I'm gonna be tackling their cinema cameras and some of the updates to DaVinci Resolve 19 that they just announced. And I'm going to cover the video broadcast products. So that's gonna be the IP converters, the new constellation switchers, video hub, and also their media player. I'm gonna talk about their new audio monitor that allows you to effectively be able to hear your audio streams. Jory, did you hear something? They do audio? Oh wait, audio's a thing? Where's my oh, mic? That's crazy, that's weird. Huh. So I chatted a little bit already about Blackmagic's new cameras in our previous NAB video, but I wanted to take a little bit more time to focus on them individually now, starting with this guy, the Pixa 6K. Now this camera is similar to the Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K in terms of sensor and resolution options. It's the exact same 6K sensor, same open gate format options, same frame rate options, but obviously visually the biggest difference is the camera body itself. This is more of a traditional box style camera, and the way Blackmagic sees it is it's a more riggable camera. The way they phrased it was they're not actually sure how people are going to be using this camera, so they want to give you every option available. So it's literally a box that you can just add what you want onto it. So on this one, for instance, they've added the new EVF, which is compatible with the Ursus Cine 12K as well. They've added a top handle here. And you could also add a external monitor through SDI, or if you want to keep the form factor light, you do get a really good four inch touchscreen monitor on here as well to adjust your settings and monitor your video if you can. Now one cool thing with this camera is it comes with three different lens mount options. You can get that with an L mount, an EF, or a PL, but the one thing to keep in mind is these are not interchangeable lens mounts. So you do have to stick with the lens mount that you buy, but you can use it with a lot of different systems. And on the other side, these are all of your ports and your battery. It takes BP batteries, which gives you a lot of flexibility for how much battery life you want because these batteries extend out. So you're not with any issues of a battery life on this. You can put whichever BP battery you want. Uh, you get time code support. You're getting a ethernet port, USB-C, two CF Express cards, but you can use that uh, USB-C to record to an external drive, just like the pocket cinema cameras. So Blackmagic also just released this Chungus here, the Ursa Cine 12K. Now this camera is the highest end cinema camera that they've ever made. What you're getting in this, as the name implies, is it's a 12K sensor, but the sensor is actually much bigger than the sensor found in their previous Ursa 12K. So you are getting excellent, excellent image quality. 16 stops of dynamic range they set on this. But what you're also getting is all of the IO and storage media management that you could possibly want in this camera. But we gotta start someplace. So let's start with the external displays you're seeing here. Now you get one nice display on the side, kind of like on the Pixis that I was showing you there, but then on the other side, I will turn this very, very slowly, you also get kind of the standard other five inch display you would get on uh, previous Ursa cameras. Now you're also getting the other features you'd expect. You're getting an optical low pass filter in this, you're getting built in ND filters, but what's really interesting is what they've done with media management. What this guy does is it comes with this Blackmagic media module, which are these guys here, and this is eight terabytes of storage, and it comes with the camera. It's very generous of Blackmagic. This right here is your eight terabytes of storage, and then they have a whole caddy system where you can dump it very easily and get your footage backed up, and then you can just slide it back in there, and you are good to shoot again. What's really nice about this is eight terabytes of essentially built-in storage lets you shoot in the fastest frame rates at the highest resolution without needing to worry about running out of storage. But this camera also is really leaning heavily into the Blackmagic cloud, so you can hook it up to the internet either through ethernet or pair it with uh, cellular data, and you can upload proxies as you are shooting with this camera. And you can even, if you want to, upload the actual Blackmagic RAW clips that you are shooting as well. It will obviously be much, much bigger, but you have that option too. But this means you could be out in the field shooting with this camera, and as you're shooting with it, you can have proxies of the clips immediately showing up in the bins of your editor working in DaVinci Resolve someplace else. Now looking at the front of the Ursa Cine 12K, you can use this with a PL mount, LPL, EF, or Hasselblad lenses, and the mounts are interchangeable. So they're really giving you a lot of flexibility with this. And actually, when Grant Petty was talking about this during the announcement, he essentially said what camera would Blackmagic want to make if they were not limited by like price or features or anything like that. So this is truly a camera that they've crammed 
everything into that they could possibly want. Although I suppose that's a little bit not true because they have also teased that there is a, a 17K Cine camera that is coming soon as well. Now there's not a ton of information on this. They do have it in a glass display up at the front um, along with the sensor size. The sensor is enormous. It is a 65 millimeter equivalent sensor. So that is hopefully gonna be coming soon. And that is what Blackmagic has new with their cameras here at NAB. So Blackmagic is showcasing DaVinci Resolve 19 here at NAB, and they have tons of stations set up because there's so many new features to talk about. Now, a lot of the new features are AI-based uh, things for like subject tracking, noise reduction, um, and audio effects that they've added. So for example, IntelliTrack is something that is now available in the color page, Fairlight, and Fusion. And what it lets you do is if you're tracking a subject, instead of putting one point, you can select multiple points for multiple subjects, and it will intelligently, using AI, track them back and forth. It was showcased to me, it was able to really quickly track multiple subjects at once. Now, there are some other updates in the color tab, and the one that struck me the most was the Film Look Generator, which is is an effect you can just add it onto a node and it lets you adjust a lot of parameters to really dial in a specific filming look. I promise I won't read all 100, but your vignetting, your halation, your bloom, grain, flicker, gate weave, you can really dial in a super specific look to your clip and then save that to your gallery just like any other film look and be able to apply that to other clips. So that is new in DaVinci Resolve 19. And another thing they have in the color tab is something called Color Slice. It's a new tool for grading your footage. And the way it was showcased to me is it really lets you fine tune things like your hue and your saturation in a way that does not cause your gain to clip. This will allow you to kind of dial in the hue of a specific color that you want and then adjust the parameters within that. But the way it was showcased to me when we were looking at the scopes, nothing was peaky. It was a really cool way to more subtly grade your footage in a way that once again, uh, you would more expect film to behave. Now DaVinci Resolve has also added a new background defocus, which works exactly how you'd expect it to in terms of the effect it does. It'll let you pull a subject away from your background and blur that background, but it's a really nice and streamlined way to do it. You can just very easily create two nodes, make one in alpha, and then in the node that you're working with, you can adjust so many parameters in terms of how you want the background blur to look. You can add a slight anamorphic distortion to it if you want to. You can really adjust it to your parameters. It's not just Gaussian or nothing. So those are some of the major updates in DaVinci Resolve 19, but there are so, so many other ones I didn't have time to talk about. Um, you can stack nodes now, for instance, in your node tree to more easily organize your color grades. Um, it supports open timeline IO, which makes importing and exporting timelines from other NLEs faster and easier. You can get automatic depth mapping, and there's also tons and tons of specific broadcast features built into DaVinci Resolve 19 as well. But Jabari will talk a little bit more about those because that is a whole category unto itself. But that is a few things that are new with DaVinci Resolve 19. It's a really big and exciting update and I personally cannot wait to start playing with it. And since we're talking about Resolve, Resolve 19 has brought some exciting new updates in terms of AI track effects in the studio version of Resolve. And there's also one other track effect that we'll talk about and there's also some mixing tools. Blackmagic have taken the AI tools of the previously available Dialog Isolator and refined them and added a bigger tool set that's able to separate audio into human voice, background noise, and ambience, which is actually the reverb that's attached to the human voice, giving you the ability to mix each of those stems discreetly. Next up is the Music Remixer. Similar to the Dialog Separator, the Music Remixer is also AI based and it works on stereo tracks to isolate vocals, guitar, bass, drums, and other, and gives you the ability to mix each of those stems independently. Next up is the Ducker. Now you might be thinking, well, there's other Ducker plugins out there on the market, or I could use a sidechain compressor to accomplish this. And while that's true, sidechain compression is kind of a brute force way of getting ducking into your audio. The new Blackmagic Ducker, however, is a more elegant solution with options for look ahead, rise time, hold, and recovery for creating really natural sounding ducking that gives the same result as a fader move. Perhaps the most exciting update to Fairlight is another AI based tool that incorporates Resolve's IntelliTracker and that's the Auto Pan Tracker. The Auto Pan Tracker writes panning automation based on motion tracking data and it has two modes. In the auto mode, it can do left to right panning. And in the manual mode, you can set up the tracking to do spatial audio, which is great if you're working in something like Dolby Atmos. You know, who knows? Maybe we'll see that down the line in the auto mode as well.
All right, so we got our hands on Blackmagic's new micro color panel, not to be confused with the micro panel. Now this uh, panel is extremely small and lightweight and it has a built-in battery. Uh, the battery should last between seven and 10 hours and it connects through Bluetooth, which means you can use it with the iPad. For any of you that really love DaVinci Resolve, they have basically the full software available for the iPad that gives you a ton of control. What I really am impressed about with this is that you know you have the same level of fine tuning that you can do on the uh, full software in here. And while it doesn't have as many buttons as the advanced or the mini panel, what's really interesting is that it has function buttons that are user programmable, or at least they will be coming soon. It's not something that's gonna be available at launch. So that means that when you want to add a window, instead of just pressing the add window button, you can hit the function button, and now you can change the shape. And you have the ability to control uh, where the window is positioned and how it's framed and the size of it all just using uh, the function buttons that are on the panel itself. Really capable stuff. I really think that colors are gonna be super excited about this, whether they're using it with their iPad or with the desktop computer. There's a lot to unpack with how Blackmagic has redesigned their video production system to take advantage of IP networks. First, they have their series of IP2110 converters. For those of you that are unfamiliar, IP2110 is a new standard that controls how devices send video, audio, and metadata across a network. The IP2110 converters are able to take the video output from, say, a camera that has 12G, SDI, or HDMI, convert that to Ethernet, and send it across 10 gigabit Ethernet ports. Now, if you're recording in 4K 60p, that will result in a little bit of compression uh, because you're going from 12G SDI to uh, 10G Ethernet. But if you're doing 4K 30 or lower, there's no compression at all whatsoever. Now, the way this pipeline works is when you're going out from your camera, whether it's natively IP2110 or using one of their converters, it then reaches this Ethernet switch which like most ethernet switches, allows you to connect multiple devices and route uh, information between them. However, what's unique about this new ethernet switch, the ethernet switch 360p, is that it also allows you to treat it like a video router. The same routers that you would use to send video signal from SDI 1 to SDI 10 and so on and so forth, you have that same level of control with this ethernet switch with any device that accepts the IP2110 standard. So this makes it really flexible to work with something like their new smart review monitors that natively take IP2110 or any of their other converters. If you want to send it to a Constellation or a media playout device or what have you. After it leaves the ethernet switch, as I just mentioned, it will go to uh, one of these IP2110 rack mount converters. This will allow you to convert it from the IP2110 back to a normal SDI video signal to go into your normal playout devices. What's also pretty cool about these devices is that uh, they do provide power over ethernet. The 4x12 is able to send out power over ethernet so that you don't have to power devices on the other end. Unfortunately, the 8x12, uh, it just would get too hot apparently, so it's not able to send power. And yes, that does mean that they're bi-directional converters that you might attach to a camera or a monitor are power over ethernet as well. Now Jabari was talking about the 2110 ecosystem that Blackmagic's really embraced this year. And we're seeing that now in the Blackmagic 12G audio monitor. This generation three update is now equipped with 2110 connectivity. So that means it can take audio and video over IP, just plug it into your network and it becomes a discoverable device using the NMOS protocol and you can route your audio to it and video signal here for your confidence monitoring. All right, last but certainly not least, we have the DaVinci Resolve Replay Editor. What's really interesting about this product is that it allows you to ingest live footage into DaVinci Resolve and then queue things up for an instant replay or to set cuts for highlights and clips so that you can have a really streamlined experience as you're working on live productions. So having everything go through DaVinci Resolve allows DaVinci Resolve to act as a media player for one, uh, but also as a really powerful editor, do slow motion, instant replays. It's a really powerful tool for broadcasters uh, that are doing sports events and other live events.
Okay, that wraps up our coverage of NAB 2024, especially this gigantic Blackmagic booth. They really brought a lot this year, and if you're wondering where everyone else is, well, they worked very hard. It's been three days now. I sent them back. I'm just here to say farewell to everyone, so let us know what you thought of the convention in the comments below. My name is Doug, and I'll see you back in New York.